I don't know about you, but when you're asked to have an assignment given and you want to do something about it and you want to do a fairly good job, you begin researching and doing things, whether you've got a favorite book at home or a library or any more, we can go to the Internet. So I went to the Internet after uh, Alan asked me to come here, and then Bob Henderson followed up about making sure I was going to be here this Sunday. And <clears throat> I saw this little story, and I don't know whether to relate to this or not, but I just I thought it was very cute and thought I'd present it to you this morning. I'd like to picture a small country church, very nice, clean little church, very few pews, but they were all filled. And as usual, the, uh, the congregation was anticipating the minister coming in and, and giving his sermon. And there's just that little murmur that goes on prior to the beginning of a church service. And all of a sudden, they looked around, there stood Satan. Well, man, they hit the exodus like you wouldn't believe. Couldn't believe that Satan was in their church, except for one man. He was standing there with his, or sitting there with his arms crossed, just with a big smile on his face. Satan walked over to him and he said, Sir, don't you know who I am? He said, I sure do. Really? Yeah, I've lived with your sister for 48 years. <laughs> no offense, ladies. Our scripture lesson this morning uh, is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. And this is when Jesus was really getting into the parables. Of course, throughout all four books of the New Testament, he did talk a lot in parables, and sometimes they're pretty difficult for us to understand. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood off by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm unlike other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all that I get. But the tax collector stood off at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy, mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Jesus had just finished uh, his parable of the unjust and the persistent woman. But now he turns to address a theme he brings up frequently. Many of the parables in Luke are centered around the contrast between the person of Jesus and the Pharisees in respect to how they deal with, with sinners. We often see Jesus going to the feast of tax collectors while the Pharisees stood without and would later ask the disciples why Jesus actually ate with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus talks in an open comparison with the tax collectors and sinners. It, when talk, in, excuse me. Jesus talks in an open comparison saying that there is more joy in heaven over a sinner that repents. More joy than what? Anything you want to compare it to. Jesus, Jesus shows compassion to a sinner woman who came to dinner at Simon the Pharisee's house. The three parables in Luke of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son are spoken in relation to the Pharisees' complaint that Jesus receives sinners and eats with them. The parable presents two people coming to the temple to pray. The first was a Pharisee, a small but influential group in Judaism. The, native, the name of this group comes from a Persian word meaning to separate. This is demonstrated in the fact that the Pharisee stood off by himself. He was too good to pray with ordinary people, especially in the presence of a taxpayer, tax collector, and also who also had come to pray. In the eyes of the Pharisees, the tax collectors belonged in the lowest social class with the prostitutes. They were prideful of their own accomplishments. They felt themselves as the true believers and the keepers of the law of Moses. We look at the prayer of this man made, this man made all of the pride comes out. He gives thanks first for what he is not. He's thankful that he's not a cheat and a swindler. 
He was not an adulterer. Looking down in contempt at the tax, tax collector, was, who was also praying, he is most thankful that he is not like that poor thing. He's a, this is a typical Pharisee-type prayer, other than they also included thanks that they were not born a woman, because women in those days were blow, the lowest space on, on the social stratification table. The other man stood and looked down at himself. He doesn't say that he noticed the Pharisee praying or anyone else. He knew what he truly was. Tax collectors were known to be swindlers and cheats. They were known to shake down extra money from those they had, appointed to, had been appointed to to collect taxes from. Even discounting the bias that, that common citizens had toward tax collectors and allowing that many were not as bad as their reputation, they really were bad enough. They were known for big parties, big lavish parties, which in some cases included prostitutes. This tax collector, if he participated in this revelry, was guilty of adultery also. He was everything that the Pharisee gave thanks that he wasn't. The Pharisee then thanked God for his positive attributes. He had these things for his badge of election. He fasted twice a week and tied 10% of everything he made. And here he was praying. He was fulfilling what is known as the three pillars of Judaism, prayer, study, and good deeds. A person who practiced this was really put, in, this, in the Pharisee's terminology, up on a particular shelf. The tax collector's prayer did not have the slightest hint of self-praise. He had nothing to offer at all. The only thing he can confess is, he is a sinner. All he could do is beat his breast in grief and plead for mercy. What he needed was penance. But he doesn't say that he brought a lamb for that offering. We know as Christians that this was only a symbol pointing to a sacrifice of Christ. God in the Old Testament showed some weariness to animal sacrifices because they weren't offered with a repentant and faithful heart. This tax collector showed exactly the contrite heart God wished from those who came to worship. This condition of a heart was far more pleasing to God than the usual outward ritual. It was a sweet-smelling offering from the heart and pleasing in God's eyes. Jesus directly says that it is the tax collector and not the Pharisee who returned home justified. Justified was a, a lasting justification unlike the temporary relief offered by sin, sin offerings at the altar, altar, which had to be repeated. It also implies that this man's life was changed forever. The Pharisee, on the other hand, was not changed at all. We should look into the Pharisee. It's not enough to just look at the tax collector. The suggestion of this parable is that the Pharisees were not justified. They were not right with God. They lifted themselves up rather than God. This makes them guilty of stealing glory from God. In other words, they were cheats and swindlers. They were guilty of spiritual adultery. In other words, they were guilty of everything the tax collector was accused of. Yet they felt no need to beat their breasts and cry for mercy. There's no indication that the Pharisee brought a sin offering to the temple. After all, he didn't feel he needed to. See how, how, how blind self-righteousness is. They thought themselves righteous. They transferred their own sin upon the tax collectors and prostitutes rather than upon God's scapegoat. Jesus. One can't be justified in this manner. In fact, their sin was actually worse than the tax collectors because they did the same things as the tax collector but did not repent and ask for mercy. When we don't cry for mercy and forgiveness, we won't get it. The parable, which is an illustration, illuminates the truth that those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So what's this mean for us? Are there Pharisees in our church? Or if we look deeply and prayerfully into our own hearts, are we Pharisees? Although we might not be so insensitive as the Pharisee in proclaiming his own goodness, do we do this in more subtle ways? Do we gossip about those caught in sin in the church and thank ourselves that sure not like them? We are warned in Scripture to consider that we are just as subject to these temptations. Instead, we are told to have compassion on them. When we see somebody, 
that's having difficulty. You're not being judgmental if you're a good friend. You want to go, you want to help them through that tough period in their life. And sometimes it just means sitting down and being with them. A more subtle form of hypocrisy excuse me, comes uh, from Satan himself when he deceived Eve by his elusiveness is when we go through the form of a tax collector's prayer without the truly contrite spirit the prayer was offered in. We thoughtlessly proclaim that we are sinners saved by grace. We confess that we are sinners, that is for sure. We presume that because we confess this with our lips and we shall find mercy. But unlike the tax collector who was justified and whose life was forever changed, we aren't. We quickly return to a life living the way we want and not a life of a repentant person. We then confess all the ways we have failed to be obedient, whether as individuals or as a church. We finish with a petition to be freed for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. And most of the time, it is a very well-constructed prayer. There's only one problem. When we don't repent from our hearts and soul and make exactly the same confession as before, we haven't been changed at all. It's this tendency to play down grace, which is the basis of our salvation. Instead of heartless sacrifices, we offer heartless prayers and confessions. We have justification in our forms of worship, but not our hearts. We must get back to the realization of the great offense of our sins. It is, only when, it is only then that we can hope to find grace and help in the time of need. It is only when the Holy Spirit examines our hearts and brings our true sin to light that we will be driven to repentance. We too need to be justified in the same way that the taxpayer, tax collector was. We in ourselves might look better than him, but we are just as needy as he was. One more thing that needs to be mentioned. Jesus didn't separate himself from sinners. He didn't stand afar off from them. He was the only man who confesses himself faultlessly before the Father and was not content to pray standing remotely from, from, the, from the sinners and tax, tax collectors. He ate and drank from them to the point he was accused, falsely slandered as a glutton and in many circles a wino. What kind of church would we be if we interacted more with this than, out, uh, this than outreach to our community than simply entombing ourselves in these four walls. We've got to get out of here. We've got to do something. A heart that is set free is set on freeing the hearts of others. And this testimony can't just be lip service. It has to be more than sharing spiritual laws. The love of God has much nat must naturally reside in our hearts. The true relief that we have escaped hellfire must be communicated to others in the hope that the hearers would we wish to escape this fate. We need to be permanently changed to bring change. A few years ago, we, we bought a book by Amy Hollingsworth. It was The Simple Faith of Mr. Rogers. And many of you that have been members of this church for a while will remember the late Reverend uh, Thomas, Lou Thomas. And when I was first put on session, we, went, we came into a session meeting and Lou had his favorite song, Mr. Rogers' favorite song, Welcome to My Neighborhood, Won't You Be My Friend and Won't You Be My Neighbor? And it was for a point that Lou was trying to make to us that we should love all the people we can. And I think Fred Rogers really exemplified a, a true Christian person. One of his famous quotes is, there are many ways to say I love you. There are many ways to say I care about you. There are many ways I say to forgive you, I forgive you. On the news, the evening that Fred Rogers had passed away, the news commentator said that Fred Rogers never mentioned God in his speeches or in his TV show. He ended it by saying he didn't have to. Should we take Fred Rogers' example and use it in our lives? After all, he was a Presbyterian minister. Amen.